The operation of Hero's Temple doors might have seemed a bit mysterious to an observer about 2,000 years ago. Heat from the altar fire operates a mechanism which is below the temple and hidden from view. The mechanism opens the doors without human intervention, and the doors remain open as long as the fire burns. Once the fire goes out, the altar cools, the mechanism's operation reverses, closing the doors and completing the cycle. The automatic temple doors illustrate some essential concepts applicable to modern engines, including heat transfer to an expanding gas, applying gas pressure to do work, and the impact of friction upon a mechanism's performance. While there's no archaeological evidence of this machine having been built at full scale, it might have been built as a demonstration model, a possibility we'll discuss in light of this working model. There have been transcriptions and translations of Hero's Greek text over the centuries, and I can only assume that the current English translation is faithful to the original text. There may have been some crude illustrations in the original text, but surviving illustrations date much later, added by Arabic and Western scribes and translators. While several of the earliest illustrations may fall a bit short of the text description and wouldn't have worked exactly as illustrated, later illustrations are quite faithful to the text and provide useful references for constructing a model. But since these illustrations were created later, some details of the design reflect the mechanical understanding of others. Continuing along this path, the model in these videos adds some of my own thoughts about those details. Still, there's much similarity among the illustrations, and it seems reasonable that the general concept is authentically ancient, and that the illustrations and text provide enough information to make a model that's fairly faithful to the original concept. While these door illustrations vary slightly, the theory of operation is the same for all. Using Thurston's text and illustration of the doors, the mechanism works like this. The heat from the altar fire warms the air in the air chamber, increasing its pressure, and the pressure in the water chamber below. This increase in pressure pushes water out of the water chamber, through the siphon tube, and into the open bucket, increasing the bucket weight. Initially, the bucket is held at its highest position by the counterweight which pulls the lines in the direction that closes the doors. Once the bucket weight reaches a tipping point, the bucket descends and lifts the counterweight, pulling the lines which open the doors. When the altar fire goes out, the air cools, reducing the pressure over the water. As the pressure decreases, water siphons back from the bucket into the water chamber, finally reaching a second tipping point at which the counterweight descends and the bucket rises to its original position, pulling the lines to close the doors and completing the cycle. Now let's talk about the model design in a little more detail. It's always interesting selecting the scale for a working model. Too small and parts get too delicate. Too large and everything can quickly get out of hand. I considered using materials and methods that might have been used for a model in Heroes times, but also wanted good visibility of model function, particularly visibility of water in the model. This led to selecting plastic for the air and water chambers, siphon tube, and bucket. And with that decision, out went strict authenticity. Some 2-inch diameter polycarbonate tubing for the air and water chambers seemed like a good idea at the time, and this selection probably had as much impact upon the model scale as any other decisions. The design began with this crude sketch suggesting the model's overall height. This seemed large enough for practical component sizes, yet small enough to easily fit on the bench. As it turned out, rigging the line, which is just sewing thread, around the small pulleys and door hinges was about as delicate an operation as I want. The model door height is 4 inches. Having no idea how high the doors of a small temple might be, I took a guess at 8 feet, more or less. For that size prototype door, the model would be 124th scale. This scale factor allows us to think about component sizes of a full-scale prototype just scaling the model dimensions up by a factor of 24. For example, assuming the same materials, weight scales is the cube of the scale factor, and each of the two one-ounce model doors would scale to a full-scale weight of about 860 pounds for each door, approaching a ton for the two doors. 
While stone was the material of choice for temples in heroes' times, wood seemed a more reasonable choice for the model, and might have been for a model in heroes' times as well. Distyle temples and structures modeled after them, such as this Athenian treasury in Delphi, typically included extended walls outside the two columns, termed distyle in antis, but the extended walls didn't seem necessary for the model. While a side-by-side -side arrangement similar to the old illustrations might be a good choice for a teaching model, it seemed that a fore-and-after arrangement might be more reasonable for a prototype, placing the altar in front and much of the mechanism directly under the temple. The model illustrates all of the essential features of the ancient illustrations. The altar, air chamber, water chamber, siphon, water bucket, lines and pulleys, doors, door hinges, and the counterweight. This version of the model is about 10 years old and will begin with some video shot in its early days. The model operates very slowly, so let's increase the playback speed by a factor of 20. Once the fire is established, it takes about five minutes for enough water to transfer to the bucket to open the doors. The fire dies soon after the doors open. The air chamber cools very slowly, so let's increase the playback speed even more. It takes about 30 minutes for the air chamber to cool enough for the added bucket water to siphon back into the water chamber. At this point, the counterweight lifts the bucket and the doors close. Let's watch again and note some details. The view on the left is static, providing a component and water position reference at the beginning of the heating phase. We'll compare this with the motion in the view on the right. At the tipping point, just before the door is open, the bucket water level has risen about four tenths inch. Then the bucket drops and the counterweight rises with each moving about two tenths inch to open the doors. The fire continues to burn at a low level for a short time and the water level continues to rise slightly. The doors close when the air chamber cools and the water level returns to close to the starting point, which is about four tenths inch above the bottom of the bucket. Now let's watch only those periods when the doors are moving, when they're opening and closing. We've mentioned door opening and closing tipping points, but the doors don't snap open and close at these points. In fact, far from it. In real time, it takes about a minute from the onset of door movement to full door opening. The door closing event takes roughly five minutes. The motion isn't smooth, exhibiting what may be friction stick slip characteristics. Now let's look at a few construction features of the model. The goal was to make it modular to simplify changing major components. The model includes two primary modules the altar module, which controls water flow to and from the bucket, and the doors module, which uses the change in bucket weight to open and close the doors. The siphon tube is the only functional connection between the two modules. Its end is submerged in the bucket water, but it doesn't touch the bucket. The temple facade isn't functional, and it's easily removed, as are the altar fairing and two additional filler pieces. Nothing is permanently attached unless necessary. The altar and doors modules just rest on the underlying structure. The siphon disconnects from the altar module frame to allow withdrawing the altar module through the opening in the structure. Clamping off the siphon tube prevents losing the water fill. The altar module consists of the altar fire pot, air chamber, water chamber, and siphon. Beyond differences in shapes of the air and water chambers and the use of some plastic, the most significant deviation from the early illustrations is the addition of a heat exchanger. It seemed that the arrangement in the early illustrations might be like putting a cooking pot beneath a stove burner, maybe not the most efficient way for the altar fire to heat the air chamber beneath it. Assuming that this might be a problem, the heat exchanger aims to improve heat transfer from the fire to the air chamber with pin fins in the fire conducting heat to and through a copper rod to pin fins in the air chamber. 
This works, so probably wasn't a terrible idea, but it doesn't confirm that the added complexity is necessary. The doors module includes the doors, hinges, pulleys, line, water bucket, and counterweight, as seen in this rough sketch. The early illustrations suggest either two or four pulleys in the system, but the model includes eight pulleys, a deviation that isn't mandatory, but seemed a more flexible design since it eliminates issues associated with pulley fleet angles and might provide useful to make layout adjustments. Reaving the line, which is just cotton sewing thread, is the most difficult part of assembly. With the line removed, the only resistance to door motion is the friction from the door hinge bearings, and the hinge bearing friction is dependent primarily upon the door weight. Since the line forces nearly cancel at the hinge drums, they don't add significantly to friction in these bearings. In this configuration, it takes only a gentle breeze or a little tilt to move the doors. The top beam holds the upper door hinge bearings and is just pinned to the uprights. Removing it frees the doors. The doors aren't fastened to the hinge pins. They're driven by friction, allowing easy adjustment of the individual door angles and the height of the water bucket relative to the water chamber. Combined with a single line, this gives the freedom to set any desired configuration before operating the model. This wouldn't be possible with doors fixed to the hinges and multiple lines with fixed connections at the hinge drums as shown in the old illustrations. While a deviation from the sketches, this doesn't change the overall model function so long as the door to hinge joints and line to hinge drum connections don't slip during operation. The upper ends of the steel door hinge pins ride in simple brass bearings. The tapered ends at the bottom of the hinge pins ride in brass bearings, resisting both thrust and radial loads. Pin connections and a couple of wedges give a bit of a sense of ancient construction. The brass pulleys ride on steel pins. So far, all bearings have been run dry, although we'll consider lubrication later. The bucket is just a 35 mm film canister with marks to measure water level. The counterweight uses small lead weights to permit weight adjustment. At this point, we understand how the doors work and its general construction. The model demonstrates that something similar to Hero's description is practical. I suspect that any reasonable person might stop while ahead, claim victory, and move on to something else. That was the original plan. But there were a few lingering questions about the model's operation and design. First, why do the doors open and close so slowly rather than quickly opening and closing at the tipping points. Minutes for these events just feels a bit slow. Next, why is the time from fire burnout to door closing so long? And finally, was the addition of a heat exchanger in the ultra module a necessary or even a wise choice? These questions led to some analysis, experiments, and an ultra module redesign that we'll discuss in part two of the Temple Doors series.